All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Charlie Gipple here, the owner of CG Financial Group. I've had about 58 ounces of, of coffee today, so we're going to have a blast on this webinar. With that, let me ask you a question, and this is kind of my test to make sure you can hear me, you can see me okay. In the questions and answer pane, answer my question. Do you think it is possible, yes or no, do you think it is possible to get somebody who has one and a half million dollars in assets their net worth is one and a half million because they have no debt. Do you think it's possible to get them qualified for Medicaid? Uh, is it possible? Um, so answer that question. Why? Because I know everybody's going to say yes, of course, because otherwise it'd be a boring presentation. But I'm asking that question, looking for an answer here, because I want to make sure that you heard my question. Because if you didn't, then we have AV issues. <laughs> That's right. Anything is possible. And I hear you. Anything is indeed possible, and I promise you everything we talk about today is perfectly legal. Not only is it perfectly legal, but Medicaid-compliant annuity, shifting an asset from here over to there into the Medicaid-compliant annuity, the correspondence back and forth to and from the Department of Human Services of Iowa in this case study, um, that's the communication is, hey, you know, you got this wrong, that needs to be excluded because we put the client's money into a Medicaid compliant annuity. So not all, you know, it's not one of those things kind of behind a cloak. Hey, yes, it's legal, but the states really frown on it. No, these are widely, widely accepted strategies here. It's just, it's just that it can be complicated. It can be very complicated. I must admit, last week, I started putting together PowerPoint slides. And you know me, you know I'm a little different and that usually I just talk without a PowerPoint, maybe sometimes my whiteboard. Why? Because that's how you find folks talk. Thus, we're going to talk about napkin diagrams that you can use with your clients. We don't go into a client's house and pop up a PowerPoint, right? You'd be kicked out immediately. You'd certainly be kicked out of my house if you came in here to solicit me and popped up a PowerPoint. But yet, all of the carrier folks, they like to use... Uh, all the carrier folks, they like to use the uh, uh, the PowerPoints. So that's not how I roll. But with this one, I started to put together PowerPoints. And last week, I thought, you know what? This presentation is going to be two hours long if I go with this. So here is what I settled on. I have PowerPoints, but the language that I'm going to use today, uh, the simplicity that I'm going to use today, it's simple. Why? Because it is enough for you to get the job done. What do I mean by that? I mean, really, really getting the job done. Everybody on this call, if you plan on doing elder law uh, planning, such as Medicaid planning, you need to be in partnership with an elder care attorney. Um, I tell you, at the beginning of the first process that I ever did one of these, there was a great attorney here in town in Des Moines, Iowa, I hooked up with, been doing uh, business with this person, not business with the person, I've been referring people to him. The first time I heard him give a quote to one of my clients or my prospects on setting up the Medicaid, rearranging and telling me, the financial advisor, what needs to be annuitized and all that stuff, I'll tell you, he said $10,000. $10,000 was the fee just to do the legwork on a lot of this stuff, to go back and forth with the Department of Human Services. I thought, wow. And this is the first process that I had been through. This was years back. I said, wow, 10, 000, that seems a little steep, but they're the best in Iowa. And they are. I will tell you about six months later, once it got approved by the Department of Human Services, they were worth every penny. That, that And they didn't charge me. They charged the clients. And the clients kind of balked at first, but it's like, listen, $8,000 a month is what you're going to spend on the nursing home bill. That is one month of nursing home that you're going to pay. And I promise you at the end, it's going to be worth it. And it absolutely was worth it. So that's my way of saying partner with an elder law attorney. They are well worth the money, even like 10 grand, right? I almost threw up on, on uh, the attorney's table when he said that. But I'll tell you, by the end, after seeing all the correspondence back and forth, kind of the negotiation back and forth as well with the Department of Human Services, once we got that snapshot that the client has resources below a certain level and all that stuff. Um, once we got that snapshot saying there, they should qualify for Medicaid. By that time, I was like, dang, this attorney has done a lot of work. I'm glad I'm not an attorney. But who's the guy advising on what annuities, for instance, to look at? Who's the guy advising on maybe a long-term care policy in the future for the person that is not institutionalized? So it's, it's really a great story here. And this is what, and then I have four housekeeping items here. 
This is what Medicaid planning focuses on. And by the way, just this one case that I'm talking about, uh, 10,000 bucks on this one case, right? And I did not do all the legwork that the attorney did, but I made $10,000. So anybody who thinks that working with Medicaid folks uh, cannot be profitable, they're wrong. It is very profitable. And who does this target? You know, we've all seen the long-term care statistics that um, question for you guys and gals. What percentage of people over the age of 65 have long-term care insurance? What percentage of people, let's just say, what percentage of people have long-term care insurance? Yep, everything from 10 to 12 to 15, call it 10%, call it 10%. I haven't looked at the daily statistic on that, but call it 10%. How many people over age 65 will need long-term care, will have a long-term care event? They say 70% of, uh, of people over age 65 will need it, right? But do you know if you're that 30% or the 70%? Okay, but 10% of folks actually have long-term care insurance. Charlie, what does Medicaid planning, what does that hone in on? Because the goal with long-term care insurance is you never have to have the Medicaid conversation. The goal is, is that extra 90% <laughs> that, that don't know if they'll need it or not eventually, but choose not to buy long-term care insurance. And therefore you will have to do crisis planning eventually, albeit maybe 10% of those folks are just ultra wealthy and hey, a nursing home, hundred grand a year, no problem. So carve out 10%, maybe another 20% or so of those 90% that they don't have enough money to where you're even talking about switching assets. You know, maybe they're at the poverty level. There, there are no assets to switch and maybe not worth your time, but let's call it 60% of folks that you get to work with. That is what Medicaid does. Medicaid is not a first resort. Medicaid is a last resort for those folks that failed to plan. And now it's too late. Very profitable, huge opportunities. Frankly, I think it's a larger opportunity than going after folks that are going to say, no, I don't want long-term care insurance all day, all night. However, those conversations are a little rarer than they used to be. I think people are coming to the realization that long-term care insurance is good. But my priorities are, first of all, long-term care insurance for the client. And then, heaven forbid, if they didn't do that, it's crisis planning. You know, on LinkedIn a while back, some clown um, kind of torqued me off. And I don't get torqued off on, on, on LinkedIn. But um, I did this video explaining what I'm talking about here. And uh, he came back and criticized me because I called it Medicaid planning. Uh, so we have these people losing their properties, losing their houses, losing their hard-earned savings. I'm talking about Medicaid planning. And if you've been through the process of this, the attorneys and all that that I alluded to earlier, there is a ton of planning that goes into this. This guy's quibbling over words because he didn't know that I'm also a long-term care fan, a big long-term care fanatic. And by me talking about Medicaid and how that is planning, that is effectively killing his long-term care insurance sale. Folks, number one, there's enough business out there. And number two, you know, it's not like if you're a Democrat, you must hate Republicans. If you're a Republican, you must hate Democrats. We all can coexist, right? I love both of these. And yes, long-term care insurance is the first and foremost. So I blasted him back, but um, it doesn't have to be us versus them, long-term care versus Medicaid. These all go together. We all want our clients to have long-term care insurance. It's just, this is the last resort. Doesn't mean, oh, because it's, because it's Medicaid, I'm not going to plan with you anymore, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client. Sorry, you're just going to have to deal with it. No. So purposely, I will call it Medicaid planning, what you see here, because that is, in fact, what it is. For those of you that have had certain designations out there, you may know what I'm talking about, the anti-planning vernacular. I will agree to disagree, you know, me and those, uh, those folks there. So Four different things here. Number one is ask questions as we go. By the way, ask questions now. If you have questions, anything you want to learn through this, feel free to throw it out there and I'll, I'll likely address that. We'll see how long we go on the webinar, but I'll certainly call out to you if you have questions, if I haven't been able to address them now. Number two, folks, AIG annuities. I love AIG annuities because they're among the top in the industry right now, number one. And number two, if you're already working with an IMO with AIG annuities, you can work with me because they dual appoint. They have multiple appointments or the structure where you can get appointed with me and maybe you're locked up with some other IMO. Why AIG annuities? You have probably read my emails. Um, that's why AIG annuities. 10.5% caps on a traditional 
S&P 500 annual reset point to point, great accumulation, but not just that, they have that same structure on their GLWB product. And that GLWB product, 7.25% is the payout factor at age 65. Now, technically it can taper off on the back end, but you have a great income product, you have a great accumulation product all under one roof. As I say, you don't have to have a GLWB on a neutered product chassis. You can have a great product, great death benefit, great accumulation potential, and great underlying income guarantees. And that's what AIG does. I'm a huge fan of AIG. And by the way, folks, uh, top street level commission, 7%. Not bad. Contact me uh, when we're done. I'd love to talk with you about AIG, get you appointed, because again, you can get dual appointed. Number three is, um, I haven't shaved in a couple of days. My wife uh, alerted me of this. It's because last night, social security seminar. Uh, the night before, social security seminar. I've been having some late nights. I'm telling you, we are filling the rooms with these social security seminars. Uh, we have it honed down to a nice science. As soon as that registration comes in, you and I get an email blasted to us so that we can reach out to that client, confirm ASAP. Um, I won't go on and on about that, but I will say, hey, um, I'll just throw this out there. If you, depending on your metropolitan area, were to write a check for $1,500 to $2,000 and had, um, let's call it, I'll be conservative, I think. Uh, and some of you have done these and you're saying, yeah, Charlie's conservative with that. If you have 50 registrants and uh, 25 or 30 of them actually attend, was that worth your money? Well, Charlie, it depends on depends on the consumers. Okay, if a few of them in the room were millionaires, every single time I do these, right? The, the, these little uh, uh, evaluations, then later I send the questionnaire. Uh, oh, by the way, yes, I wanna set up a meeting with you on that date. Uh, yeah, this is from last night here. Yes, I wanna set up a meeting with you on that date. That's, that's the back of the questionnaire. And then I have all of these other ones here, right? Would that be worth your money? Folks, social security seminar works. That's number three. Number four is exciting things coming uh, by December. And that is behind CG Financial Group's password protected website, which it exists. It's just, you don't see it yet. We're gonna launch it. You're going to have everything, single sign on in one place here in about a month and a half. Firelight, life insurance e-apps, life insurance quoting software, i.e. iPipeline. Uh, let's see, financial planning software. Uh, what I have in the Retirement Academy now, 500 videos like this, webinar replays like this, archived emails that I sent out. It's all going to be behind this password protected area at CG Financial Group. What I just explained, how much does that cost you? It costs you zero if you're working with CG Financial Group. And I'll tell you, because I'm writing the check for this stuff. It is um, at the agent level, for me, it's tens of thousands of dollars a year, th this technology for you. Um, let's say it's 5,000 bucks a year or so in technology that you get for free. And that's and you have that technology now, it's in the business builder, but all this stuff, plus the retirement academy stuff, it's gonna be on CG Financial Group. Single sign on, which is a good thing in a world where we want convenience, that's gonna happen by the end of the year. Okay, if there are no questions, let's jump right into this. I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint. We're going to do a share screen here. Now, can you folks see my screen? Can you see my screen okay as I drink some more coffee? This is like that story where um, Medicaid is very much like that story. I haven't gotten any answers yet, folks. Can you see my screen? Uh, Medicaid is like that story uh, where you have this oil tycoon who has a chauffeur driving him to this keynote set, uh, keynote um, presentation that he's going to do. Still no responses, folks. Can you not see my screen? Um, this oil tycoon is driving to, yes, okay, yeah. You were commenting down below. I was looking up top, so that was my fault there. A lot of people were actually commenting. This oil tycoon in the back of the car, as the chauffeur's driving him there, the chauffeur says, your job is so easy. So when you go in and give this keynote speech on global oil markets and how currencies affect the flow of oil and money and, and all that stuff, I think I can give that speech. Your job is so easy. The oil tycoon says, well, then let's, let's switch suits. You get up there and pretend you're me, and I'll just sit in the crowd like I'm the chauffeur. Uh, you know, So the chauffeur, who's pretending to be him, gets up there and starts the, the presentation about this very, 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 very complicated thing. And the first question pops up from the back. And again, it's about macro 
macroeconomic conditions and currency fluctuations, what that means to the drilling and shale and all that other stuff. And uh, complicated question, he says, that is the dumbest, most easiest question I've ever heard in my entire life. That is so dumb. I'm going to have my chauffeur down here in the front answer that question. Um, that's kind of how I feel with uh, with how I felt with Medicaid last week, as in, you know what, this could be like rocket science. Sometimes we need to just, we only have so much information in our brain or that our brain can hold. We need to look to those type, we need to look to the elder law attorneys to get into the nitty gritty. And it's not rocket science, it's just a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, Charlie, so if my social security goes to um, if my social security goes to uh, Medicaid now, and I just get a, an allowance of $50 a month, if I'm in the nursing home, uh, what happens with my, what happens with my Medicare deductions? Is that taken care of automatically? What happens with my Medicare supplement? Does my Medicare supplement get paid for by Medicaid? All of these logistical tactical things, that's where you don't have to remember if you have a good elder law attorney. So here is the process. Uh, Medicaid is not Medicare. And I think most of us know this, but I'll tell you, we take for granted what we know. You talk with consumers and you talk with them about Medicaid is not Medicare. Almost, I would say 50% of consumers just look at them as the same. No, Medicare, as we know, is is health insurance for those age 65 and above, right? What Medicaid is, is if certain people are below certain thresholds, Generally, when it comes to assets, and I'm going to talk with you about thresholds, uh, certain asset levels, as well as income levels, and if one needs long-term care, for instance, and it's not just long-term care, it's also health insurance, right, the Medicare covers, or Medicaid covers, but for purposes of our conversation, everybody gets Medicare if they're age 65 for the most part. What about Medicaid? Only those that are typically financially needy, two different requirements. The financial requirements, which I'm going to share with you here, and the second requirement is usually, um, not usually, it's the level of care requirements, right? So let's talk about the financial requirements, the level of care requirements, then we're going to get into the case study here. So that's really in a nutshell how I talk about, how I just merely introduce the notion of Medicaid. You need to go to the nursing home. John, your spouse needs to go to the nursing home. Medicaid steps in if we're below certain thresholds. So what is the financial threshold number one that I want to share with you? Um, it is the asset limit. How much in assets does the institutionalized spouse get to keep? And if she has more than that, or he has more than that, statistically, it's going to be she has more than that. Uh, if she has more than that, how much is it that she has to spend down? She needs to get her assets, and I'm using he and she just because that's the case study here. The institutionalized spouse, the one that's going to the nursing home in order to qualify for Medicaid, has to have assets below $2,000. What kind of assets? This is where we're going to get into countable assets versus non-countable assets. So their, their house, their residence is worth half a million dollars. Does that mean they have to sell their house? No, because there are certain non-countable assets. And I emphasize that because we're going to get into the vernacular here. You're allowed certain non-countable assets. Uh, your clothing, obviously, if you have a, a gazillion dollars worth of clothing, <laughs> they're not going to make you literally sell the shirt off your back to get into the nursing home. So you get below that asset level. So you have a husband and wife. She's, she's going to the nursing home. You know, the example I'm going to use here in a bit, which is John and Jane, it's technically not their names, but I'm calling them John and Jane for this. Uh, she had a stroke immediately, basically immediately went into the nursing home, right? Um, she has to have assets down to 2000 below $2,000, uh, or she's just not eligible for Medicaid. Now, what about the spouse? What about John in that example? Well, the community spouse, so let's say we have one and a half million dollars and countable assets where Medicaid says, you can't have these, you can't have these, or you can only have so much of these. That's called countable assets. Um, how much does he get? The spouse 
gets to keep. State of Iowa, as I said here, this can vary by state. These are pretty general, or these are pretty um, uh, uh, uniform across the country. Uh, let's see, by the way, we have a couple questions. Um, in a way, it's like how FAFSA counts certain assets and excludes others uh, for expected family contribution. Yes, that's exactly what it is. You know, think of it as countable and non-countable. I do want to use a vernacular that like the Iowa Department of Human Services and almost every other Medicaid office in the country uses, just so as you're reading stuff, you know what that means. Okay, so if they have a gazillion dollars in assets above the little math here, 137,400 plus hers, 139 uh, or 2000, which equals $139,400. There is an amount where they have to spend that down before they qualify for Medicaid, right? It's, however, you as a financial advisor, hey, I can't help you with qualifying for Medicaid. Talk with me once you've paid the nursing home $8,000 a month and spun that down to 137.44 for him and then 2,000 for her. No, thus the purpose of this conversation. There are strategies to immediately get rid of those countable assets so we are below these thresholds, right? And then you have an income limit. Uh, you know, so for her, for the applicant or more technically the institutionalized spouse, for the institutionalized spouse, she cannot have income coming in of any more than $2,523 per month. To simplify, if she has more than that, then that is effectively her copay. Um, and by the way, her, her copay, um, you know what? I'm going to go into the recapture. I get this question a lot. Is Medicaid going to, so I get my client on Medicaid. Is Medicaid going to come back and recapture from my family? The answer to that question is yes. Well, why, Charlie, are we even talking about this? If eventually, whether after death or during life, the assets are going to be lost, I'm going to talk about that. And it has to do with, it partially has to do with the fact that um, when Medicaid is paying for care, uh, and thus they go back and recapture that, let me ask you a question. Is Medicaid charged by the nursing home more or less than if you and I were to walk into a nursing home, just private pay, it's called. So you and I have enough money, we're going to walk into the nursing home and say, how much is this, th this room every month? Do you think Medicaid pays more or less than you and me, the average Joe off the streets? Um, answer that question here. Does Medicaid pay the nursing homes more or less than you and I off the streets if we were to private pay? Less, of course, right? So think about this. So that's great, Charlie. So we're going through this process and you're telling me that when I die, if we've done all this right, when I die, we're gonna owe Medicaid a ton of money. Hopefully we're gonna owe Medicaid a ton of money, right? That means this was worth the process, but is it worth the process? Because we're gonna come back and recapture from my estate. Well, let me ask you a question. Is Medicaid going to recapture based off how much they charge the nursing home or how much private pay would have been, how much they charge the nursing home? So I get that. I've gotten that a few times is why are we even doing this if it's going to recapture? Uh, anyway, and there's trusts and things that we'll talk about in a bit to avoid that recapture. But even if even if my client who just went into the nursing home or my client's spouse who just went into the nursing home when we got qualified for Medicaid back in August, I'm going to show you the documents here in a bit. Charlie, what if she, what if she, what if she um, you know, lives a couple years in the nursing home uh, or I should say six months or so in the nursing home. So we have all these upfront expenses. She passes away you know, and then they come back and then they recapture that from me. Well, first of all, Mr. Client, they don't recapture until you, the spouse, is dead, right? Her and him. Once, once the two of you are gone, that's when they'll recapture. But second of all, they're going to recapture less than you otherwise would be paying today because you can pay. You have one and a half million dollars in the bank effectively. You can pay. Why don't I just pay now? Because of what I just said, because you're paying more than what ultimately will be taken from the estate, right? So I hope that makes sense here. And there are some other thresholds. There are a lot of other thresholds like a, a spouse, spousal uh, uh, monthly, M-M-M-N-A, monthly 
minimum needs allowance that the spouse can get. So if the spouse has income below uh, $3,435, the one, the community spouse, the one that is still out in the community, what can happen is the institutionalized spouse, her in my example, some of her income can actually be diverted to him because he's almost at the poverty line, right? Uh, technically not like 300% of the poverty line, but there are a lot of thresholds out there. Again, I want you to know what you need to know. And that is this in front of you and let the attorneys deal with the other stuff. And then I'm going to show you a little napkin diagram here in a bit. So that's the financial requirement, very much in general. It can vary by state. Then you have level of care requirements. Um, the nursing home, you know, the first thing that happened um, after, which was kind of interesting to me, the first thing that happened after, at least on this last one, I don't remember the other few that, that I've dealt with, but um, the no, it was actually before. But I thought it was weird because it was around the time where we actually got the approval. And it is a level of care report from the nursing home. Um, the Department of Human Service requested a level of care report. Why is that? Because first of all, in order for, <laughs> if I'm over 65, I cannot just go to Medicaid and say, hey, I don't really need care, but my assets are below this. I just kind of want to have other people take care of me, right? Um, I satisfy the financial requirements. So therefore, I just want other people to take care of me for the rest of my life in a nursing home. And by the way, folks, my mom was a nursing home administrator for 30 years. She, she ran the place. So there's a lot that I know about nursing homes. But I'll tell you, one thing I do know is this would never happen to where, oh, I want to go hang out in the nursing home, even though I'm physically capable. There has to be a level of care requirement. But then, of course, checkpoints. Uh, the level of care from the nursing home to the Department of Human Services, the Medicaid office, um, those are items that, that is needed on an ongoing basis. But in short, a doctor must declare my client or the wife of my client that, yes, she needs a skilled nursing facility, right? So that's the level of care threshold. A lot of people are like, well, what about in-home care? What Medicaid is, is it's a state and federal partnership, right? Um, the federal government sets certain rules um, that the states, or set certain guide rails, so to speak, that states need to follow. And generally, in-home care, it's not a part of the general Medicaid system. So what do you have? You have these waivers to where, um, to where the... The need for a true institution like a nursing home is waived, for example. So I'll cut to the chase. Is in-home care, Charlie, is that covered? What if my wife, what if she gets better and she wants to go back in the home? Or, or maybe she's not going to the nursing home. Can we do in-home care? Depends on the state. If the state allows your client uh, uh, the waiver, the HCBS waiver or the waiver related to home and community-based services, HCBS, it is possible to get in-home care when it comes to, to get in-home care paid for by Medicaid if, you know, uh, uh, it's very subjective to the state, but yes, if that waiver exists and if the qualifications, which are usually activity of daily living qualifications, are met. So level of care requirements, and usually this isn't even a conversation because usually by the time we talk about Medicaid, um, usually it's nursing home and usually it's without a question that this person needs the nursing home. In my example, this lovely lady, and by the way, I met these, I, I met these folks uh, years back at a seminar. Uh, I recently met him who came to my social security seminar and he said, hey, my wife, uh, who, who am I calling them in this one? It's not their real name. Oh yeah, John and Jane. It's not their real name. It's a small world here in, in, in Iowa. So I don't want to call them by their real first names because if somebody were to listen in or whatever, it's a small world here. I don't want them to know. So John and Jane, hey, Jane just went to the nursing home. She had a stroke a while back. Oh man, I'm sorry to hear that, John. Um, and that's where we started talking about this. I said, so Here's the deal. We've talked about Social Security at the seminar, but Medicaid is completely different. It's not Medicare, it's Medicaid. Uh, and these folks were uh, upper 70s, our upper 70s. She is still alive in the nursing home. He is still alive, uh, around 78 years old, uh, 76, 78. I don't recall exactly, but she had a stroke, went to the nursing home. He came to me and what I said was, 
is this is the part of the process. So we're going to have to sit down with the attorney and get everything, all of your assets laid out on a sheet. And I drew this out in a napkin diagram. So here is what the government, the state government says. You have countable assets and you have non-countable assets. What's the difference between these? The countable assets or the non-countable assets rather, you can have a gazillion dollars in non-countable assets and still qualify for Medicaid, which John, Medicaid, what it is, is, is it's for the financially needy. And you're not financially needy right now. You have one and a half million dollars, but the goal here is, is your non-countable assets, clothing, household furnishings, uh, uh, your wife's primary residence, which is also yours, uh, burial spaces, uh, irrevocable funeral arrangements, which he didn't have, but I laid it out on the thing, uh, a car for her. You could have a gazillion dollars in, in this, but if you have a gazillion dollars over here, you have to get rid of this gazillion dollars over here to qualify for Medicaid. Well, how in the world are we going to do that? The goal is, is there are strategies to move these over to the other column. Checking accounts owned by you and her. And by the way, keep in mind, John, that you can have upwards of $137,000 yourself, her $2,000. So if you have a big estate, which at the time I was talking with him about this, I, I didn't know much about his estate. Um, you may have a lot to spend down, right? IRAs. Well, how do you spend down an IRA, especially if that IRA is owned by her? We're going to talk about that. Mutual funds, uh, real estate that one is not living in, farmland. So his deal was, and still is, um, farmland. It's been around for generations and generations. Uh, I'll round down and say it's 100 acres. It's 100 and some. 100 acres here in Iowa, $10,000 an acre. That's a million dollars, a million dollars in farmland, right? It's not huge farmland, but it's farmland extremely important to him and his family. Um, and by the way, some of you may have, may have seen this in my Broker World column. I'm a columnist for Broker World. And this is a little napkin diagram I shared in there. And a lot of folks sent me emails that read Broker World and said, I like that diagram. I like the simplification. It works. Now, what I added, though, here recently is this. What if Larry came to me and said, hey, we need to qualify for Medicaid now, immediately, because the clock is ticking. The nursing home is sending me my $8,000 a month bills. We need to get qualified immediately. And this is crisis planning, folks. This is crisis planning. Um, if you've ever talked to an elder law attorney, and if you hear them talk about Medicaid, they use the terminology crisis planning all the time because these folks, they, they haven't planned, but yet one goes to the nursing home and it's, wow, my hourglass of money is going to 8,000 a month. Um, let's see, is there a difference in care between those who are on Medicaid and those who are on private pay? Um, yeah, th th there are, again, certain guide rails there. Uh, she... I, I had a conversation with the nursing home. A good financial advisor should be involved in all of this, and I am. Uh, and you'll see why I am now deeply embedded with this family. Uh, their son is actually my number one client, has uh, a few million with me on my investment advisory site. Um, so I'm deeply embedded with this family. And you know what? I've done a good job for them. And who is going to inherit these assets? So I should be. Um, but anyway, um, talking with the nursing home, uh, me, the attorney, and the lady at the nursing home that coordinates all this, I said, hey, am I right that she is not in a private, and I've never been out to see her or anything, but am I right that she's not in a, in a private room? They go, technically, it's not a private room. Um, technically, she cannot have a private room because this is not private pay. Um, just kind of a funny story here, but we have we have, they had something in there. I think it was a wheelchair or a bed or something, but it was empty. The basically it was a private room and they were not, they're nice folks in Southwest Iowa, this, this nursing home is, but um, she, the client or Jane, whatever I'm calling her here, Jane effectively got a private room, but to answer your question, it's not the same level of care. My mom, um, I've asked her this before. Hey, somebody comes to you private pay, somebody comes to you uh, uh, that you know is going to either be Medicaid or is already Medicaid. Is it the same room? She goes, no, it's certainly not. My neighbor, uh, 30 feet from me, owns about uh, uh, 10 nursing homes, right? So 
it's interesting hearing their conversations. He will tell you that 50% of folks in Iowa that are in the nursing home are on Medicaid. 50% of the folks in Iowa are on Medicaid. Is there an opportunity here? Heck yes, there are. I would argue that a good chunk of those 50% probably have a lot of assets and they maybe had a good financial advisor, a good agent on their side, right? All right, so look down here on the left. Also, anything sold for less than market value within the last 60 months. I'm gonna show you in the case study, um, my guy, John, sold his son, who is my top client, um, sold his son uh, his $150,000 car collection, a bunch of old cars, his $150,000 car collection. Is that legal, Charlie? Can you do it? Yes, as long as it is for fair, fair market value. But what if what if John, who I talked to at the seminar, says, yeah, we want to get her qualified for Medicaid. I just gave away all my assets. So we should be below that $2,137,000 level. Is she going to get qualified for Medicaid? No. There's going to be a period of time to where the Department of Human Services says, yeah, so you got rid of a million bucks. Um, Iowa's divisor. Let's simplify it and say the average nursing home in Iowa is $8,000 a month. So whatever you gave away a million bucks divided by $8,000 per month, <laughs> that's like a hundred years, that is your penalty period. We will not pay for anything until that penalty period is absorbed. Basically, if you otherwise did not give away that asset, how long would it take you for spend all, to spend all that million bucks down? because that is the penalty period. So my point is, is anything sold within this waiting period of five years, there's gonna be a penalty period. California, you Californians, you have a bit of an exception there and that is 30 months. So if, you, if somebody gave away something to their kids, hey, don't wanna deal with recapture, all that stuff, I just wanna give it to little Jimmy. 31 months ago, that's not an asset that's counted in the countable assets. So the goal is to move all this stuff to the right and to the right, by the way, let me ask you this question. If the day before somebody goes into the nursing home, and this is actually kind of the crux of everything here. The day before she goes into the nursing home, a gazillion dollars in countable assets were put into a Medicaid compliant annuity. The day before she goes into the nursing home, um, the timings, I'll get to that, but can they qualify for Medicaid? A gazillion bucks, it's within the five-year period of time or California, 30 months. You move that in yesterday to a Medicaid compliant annuity. Today, you're going to the nursing home and trying to get qualified for Medicaid. Are you gonna get quali uh, qualified for Medicaid? Of course, that's the crux of all this, right? So let's go to their exact case study because a stream of income, a qualified stream of income, Medicaid compliant annuities. Oh yeah, that's an immediate annuity. I'll go to uh, uh, Athene, one of my favorite companies on earth. I'll go to American Equity, one of my favorite companies on earth. They don't have Medicaid compliant immediate annuities. They have immediate annuities. They're only a couple of handfuls, uh, maybe a handful I'll say at least the main players of Medicaid compliant annuities out there. And you know what? I'm not gonna tell you who the Medicaid compliant uh, uh, players are. If you have that question, feel free to come to me. But there are immediate annuities that will go as low as months, not years. Uh, I saw one, um, I saw one case actually, it was like an eight month Medicaid compliant annuity. Why so short? Why do we want it so short? I'll get into that here in a bit. But Medicaid compliant annuities satisfy the requirements of the DHS or the Medicaid office in that they are irrevocable. Um, by the way, you generally want to name the beneficiary if one dies during the period certain. We'll get into this some more. So if she dies, for instance, um, actually if he dies because he is technically the owner um, on his, we'll talk about both. But if he dies during the period certain, who gets the proceeds of that immediate annuity income? It's the state generally. Usually the primary beneficiary is the state, the state Medicaid office there. So that's another requirement, non-transferable, irrevocable. And then there are a few other things that make a Medicaid compliant annuity, a Medicaid compliant annuity. Uh, there are only a few companies that have them. Um, who those are, I can talk with you about that some other time, but work with somebody that knows this stuff pretty darn good because this is not for the faint of heart. 
All right, so countable assets, non-countable assets. These I rounded up and down just to make the math simple for purposes of this. Let's see, do we have any questions yet as we get into this? All right, so although we're getting in nitty gritty now, are you guys getting anything out of this so far? Just kind of the gist, that napkin idea, does that help maybe when you're explaining to a client that napkin idea, what the goal is with all of this? Um, yeah, good, good. All right, so here is his situation. Then we're gonna get into all of this stuff. What did we do? What did we do? I'm gonna go over what we did with this. So this is, a, this is the real deal here. And by the way, from the Medicaid office, Department of Human Services, look at that beautiful form. Aren't they so dynamic? Aren't they so charismatic the way that our governments work? Uh, your application is approved for medical assistance beginning 6 one uh, approved. <laughs> you know, I look at these and I'm like, so is this a good letter or is it a bad letter? I can never tell the difference with these. So that's the end result of all of this, I'm happy to say. So what was the beginning result? My second meeting with him after that social security seminar, was, here is what we have. I said, okay, we're going to have to get with the attorney here. He says, number one, uh, she has a Roth IRA. It's around 50,000 bucks. Again, I'm rounding. Uh, he has, uh, they both have a joint brokerage account. Okay. Is there a significant amount of gain in that brokerage account? Meaning if we cash that sucker out, move it to an annuity, what kind of tax liability is there going to be? Uh, his traditional IRA, doesn't matter what the gain is. It's all going to be taxed if he just cashed it out, but we don't need to do that. We'll get to that in a bit. His car collection, 150,000 bucks, like I said. Joint bank accounts, you'll see he has a lot of cash. He needs a lot of cash because he's a sole proprietor and he run, uh, construction uh, uh, equipment. He's always pushing dirt. He's always pushing dirt when I call him. He's got a big caterpillar. Um, so he spends a lot of money as he should. So he's got a lot of money in the bank. And that's also going to inform our decision on what we spend down, what we don't. A lot left in the bank account when we're done here. A second property, it's, it's a little tiny house in Southern Iowa, one of the small towns there, at only 100,000 bucks, right? Wow, what do we do with that? Her life insurance policy has cash value. Let me ask you a question. Is $7,000 in cash value more than $2,000? <laughs> yes, it is, yes. Oh, yes. A couple of you are very good. Yeah, you wrote back. Yes. Great job, folks. That, that's an A. Yes, it is more than $2,000. So we kind of have a problem here, don't we? His life insurance cash value, $10,000. Uh, over here, non-countable. Um, now, when we first started talking, that farmland, the land, Charlie, I'm really concerned about losing my property, really concerned about losing my property. So when I first started making this, I put that in the countable asset section. I put that in the countable asset column, just as kind of my takeaway, my fact finder here, countable assets, farmland, um, which is big, right? That, that means a million dollars it has to be spent down. How did it end up in the non-countable column? So note to, note to yourself here, right? Note, note to you guys. Um, one meeting with my attorney, my very good attorney, uh, he says, um, so Charlie, is that farm, is the house on the farmland? I said, no, I, I asked him because I, I wasn't born yesterday, right? I asked him if the house was on the farmland. He goes, okay, is the farmland contiguous with the house? Is it connected? Like, no, it's technically across the street, but there's nothing between the how other than the street, it's contiguous. Think Montana out there, right? Where, where you have all these little tiny roads and, and, you know, if it's contiguous, that's effectively the property. That's effect. I'm like, even though it's different plots and everything, he goes, yes, that's a non-countable asset. I said, well, that's what I thought would be the major hurdle here. So FYI, farm, and technically if farmland was used in a business, which this farmland is not, uh, if it's used in a business, there are exceptions to that, to where it can still be a non-countable asset. But I'll tell you with this particular case, until talking with the attorney, I thought it was going to be a countable asset. But still, what do we have here? On the left-hand side, we have countable assets of $617,000. It's a quick subtraction problem, right? How much above $139,000 are we? We are $477,600 too high. Something needs to be done. 
Um, so we embarked on about a four month journey here with attorneys uh, and they earn their money and I certainly earn mine here. So what did we do? Any questions so far? Did I mention AIG, by the way, folks? Talk to me about AIG. Talk to me about life insurance. Protective life insurance is killing it. Um, no questions. All right. Everybody must be understanding all of this stuff perfectly then, right? All right. So, um, and this is the case study. There are other case studies. Well, what if they both go to the nursing home? Uh, what if they want immediately in home care? Not going to talk about that. We can talk. If you have a client, if you have a client, call me up. I have, they're not on retainer, but I'll tell you, I send a lot of clients their way. And at least in the state of Iowa, somewhat consistent with most other states, um, he'll say, hey, you know, tell your agent to tell their client that this is probably what would happen. So that's a service that I offer a lot of folks that uh, use the Medicaid and not just Medicaid, other stuff as well. I, I have folks to tap into. So here's what we did. Her Roth IRA, what did we do? There's no tax on the Roth IRA, of course. So it was really a calculate, and every one of these has context around it I want to discuss. Technically, in the state of Iowa, we could have kept it a Roth IRA. We could have had it in her name. Well, Charlie, is that an asset, though, above 2000 bucks? Well, obviously it is, right? But it's a Medicaid-compliant SPIA. You know, a payment stream that's compliant is not an asset. Even if it's in her name, yeah. But Charlie, if she's getting the checks... $50,000 over, this was a four-year uh, four year immediate annuity. So if she's getting checks of uh, uh, $1,000 a month, in addition to her other income, isn't that above her um, her 23, how much was it? 2300 and some change that she ca cannot have above that. In many states, not all of them, there is a name on the check rule. What is that? It is any income that goes to any, but whose income is it? Whoever's on the check, whoever is on the check. So this particular insurance company that I used, um, I asked them, I said, so the name on the check rule, if I have her owning the Roth IRA, which we cannot transfer to his name, um, but her owning the IRA, can he get the check? Oh yeah, the Medicaid compliant annuities, we can write the check to him, even though it's her Roth IRA. So we could have kept it intact with a Roth IRA. Uh, of course, they throw out the carrier disclaimer, but, but check with your elder law attorney. In the end, I said, you know what? It can be a fuzzy area. Let's just cash out her Roth IRA. No taxes, nothing. There's not going to be much interest in the immediate annuity, right? That's not what this is for. So let's just move that into the immediate annuity in John's name there. What about the joint brokerage account? Uh, we cash that out and we put that $60,000 into the non-qualified immediate annuity. We combine that with the top one. What about his traditional IRA? Um, his traditional IRA, and by the way, what we're doing it, by doing all this is we are spending it down to that $139,000 level, right? So we pick and choose what assets we need to put in the annuity, which ones are going to be a part of his $139,000 that they get a key. His traditional IRA, we don't want to cash it out right now. Now, granted, it's all going to be un ira as it pays out over the four-year period of time, but you know, that's that's fine. I don't want him to have a big tax li a big tax liability this year. Cashing it all out this year, what does that mean? It means IRMA, it means Medicare premiums skyrocket, right? It means social security taxation, which may happen anyway a little bit because we did have to do some things here. But I said, we want to keep that in IRA. We want to spread that pain out over a period of time. So we have a second immediate annuity, and that's his small IRA immediate annuity. It gives him like $900 a month or something like that. His car collection. His son um, bought it. His son bought it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I said, I originally told him um, that they have to sell the car collection. Like, well, we don't want to sell a car collection. We want to keep that in the family. And the son, who who I knew what he was thinking, he goes, what if I buy it? You absolutely can do that. It has to be fair market value. You can't do it for a dollar. Otherwise, you have that penalty period type thing. That's equivalent to giving it away, giving it away within the five-year period of time. So um, there was a, a bill of sale written up by our elder, uh, elder law attorney. 
and 150,000 or so changed hands. Well, that's great. So now, now he has 150,000 in cash. So what does he do? What does he and the institutionalized spouse do? You put that into the non-qualified immediate annuity, or you put it into, yeah, one of the two immediate annuities, obviously the non-qualified Medicaid compliant annuity. Joint bank accounts, what did we do there? We moved half of that joint bank account, half of that joint bank account into his name because he needs to continue. He needs to continue with a bank account and that $100,000, half of that is for his spending money with his business. The other half, again, we included that in non-qualified SPIA. So we moved it out of the joint. We don't want them jointly owning anything. We don't want her uh, owning anything other than up to $2,000. So we moved that over to his name. What did we do with her? Oh, second property. Sold the house, little small town Atlantic, sold the house. What did we do with that? We included that into our first non-qualified annuity. Uh, what about her life insurance policy? So this is what's interesting. We haven't changed the ownership yet. Um, around the time, and we had talked about this previously, me with the elder law attorney, and I don't screw up on stuff like this. I'll tell you, I, I don't. I'm belt and suspenders. But after the approval came through <clears throat> from the state, I'm looking through all of, I'm looking through his file, which is actually somewhere around here. I was looking through his file and I said, did we screw up? I don't remember our conversations around this. I'm looking at this asset that we did not cash out or we did not move into John's name. She has $7,000 here. Did we screw up? He goes, no, no, no. You don't, you don't remember um, talking with me about this. I'm like, I'm sure I, I'm sure I have the notes, but I know that she has 7,000 in assets. She just got approved. What's going to happen? She can only have 2,000. You actually have 90 days, he says. We talked about this. You have 90 days for them to transfer ownership to him, which I'm working on right now as we speak. So 90 days, what we're doing is we are moving the ownership of her policy over to him. We want to keep that life policy. Why? Because heaven forbid, should she die this year, uh, the death benefit, it's not massive, but it's like $25,000 or something, you know, roughly four times the cash value. So heck, let's keep that intact if we can. So that's a part of his 137,000, right? So is the $10,000 uh, cash value life insurance policy. Here's a strategy. Here's a strategy. Um, Let's say that an elder law attorney brought this up, uh, which I thought was interesting. If both of them, if there was no change of ownership there, technically, what could she do? She could take a loan against that policy. He says, well, what you can do is you can take a loan against the policy, you know, and suck that down to $2,000 and she's fine. And I'm like, why would we do that when we can change the ownership over to him? He goes, oh, that's a great point. Um, I said, but the loan thing is an interesting point for future cases as well. You take out the loan, the cash value, the net cash value sucks down, and that's a way of doing it. Um, so two different, it's funny how we all live in our own jar here and we have different takes on this. Working with an elder law attorney, you see uh, you have your side and you see their side. And he kept his intact. So in the end, here's what we have. All of the green here went into the non-qualified annuity. Um, that's a $460,000 non-qualified annuity. The blue went into the qualified annuity. His name is going to be on the check when that immediate annuity payment comes. This is something that usually Medicaid compliant uh, annuities will allow for. She owns it. It's still not an asset, right? Not accountable asset. Well, but does she own the income? If her name is on the check, she will, which would be bad in the future. If his name is on the check, though, that's called the name on the check rule. Uh, does 134000 get recount? No, no, this is verbatim. Mike, how you doing? This is uh, verbatim what the attorney said. He, he can win the lottery. He can make a gazillion bucks a year, and he could, they could win the lottery. It's Well, he can win the lottery, I should say. So Yes, if she gets assets, if she gets assets of above $2,000, her herself in her own name, then yes, then you're going to run into problems there, right? But him, you know, that $137,000, which is his allowance, he can win the lottery and it's absolutely fine. That's verbatim what the attorney said. So what's the end result here? We've moved all of this except for, you do the math here, right? So that $200,000 there, half of that was his. He needed cash to live off of. 100,000 is his. 
Plus he has what else in his name? 7,000, her life insurance policy, 10,000, his life insurance policy. He has $117,000 in his name and she's got maybe a few hundred dollars. We are below our 137,000 for him. We are below our 2,000 for her. And most importantly of all this, what did we get in the mail? Uh, this would have been back on June 24th. So, wow, that's no more than like a month and a half ago. June 24, you're, you're approved for medical assistance. But as I looked at this, so the attorney sends us to me and says, hey, you know, approved. Well, their participation, though, my client's participation, $951. So again, context, side notes here, um, $951. So Medicaid gets their social, her social security check, right? Um, minus $50. Isn't that nice? Uh, she gets to keep $50 from her social security check. Um, and that social security check, it's also netted out. Of course, you have Medicare, it's netted out against that, which is actually a different health, it's a Medicaid health plan now, uh, where the attorney said, hey, you have, I don't remember who it was through Blue Cross Blue Shield card now. So it's no longer uh, Medicare. Um, and I'm not a health insurance guy, but basically all of these expenses net out against social security and social security is just kept with the government. Um, but then I see this, this $951. I said, what, what the heck's going on here? Why $951? Their total social, her total social security was only like $850. So that's where we go to the next page here. And I see gross unearned income here, 1374. She gets her needs allowed. So 1374, that's her unearned income. Where's that coming from? She doesn't have 1374 coming in. She has like $800 in social security that should be up here, minus her personal needs allowance, which she gets to keep in pocket, minus, so this is some of the logistical stuff. What happens with her, her Medicare supplement plan? Is that taken care of by Medicaid? Do, do, should, should she keep it? All these questions, right? The logistical stuff. Well, she should keep it. Medicaid wants her to keep it because Medicaid is the payer of last resort. And if she does keep it, that just nets out against, she, she effectively gets credit for it anyway, because that nets out against her social security check, which just reduces her participation. So I said, so none of this makes sense. That, that should only be like 800 bucks towards the top. Why $951? Well, come, uh, come to find out, they um, after we sent a message to the Department of Human Services, they came back and it was an issue with the income that she had coming in last year on her securities. So she had income coming in from her securities. And, and this is an interesting point, right? So what did my attorney, her attorney, write back to the Department of Human Services? We have taken that X hundred thousand dollars, what was it, a uh, uh, or no, it was the um, joint brokerage account, right? Joint brokerage account, non-qualified. They had income coming in. What did he say? We annuitize that in a Medicaid compliant annuity. And therefore, whatever it is, $500 should not be in that calculation. The end result should be $400. They came back and said, boom, you're right. Uh, we're, you're right. Her contribution is only $451. And that comes from her social security check. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff that happens with these, right? And there's a lot wrapped up in that. This is not one of those kind of high, as long as it's legal, let's not tell, you know, let's not tell the state we're doing this. No, this is a widely accepted thing that um, I don't know that you're encouraged to do it as a financial professional. And some may be really patriotic in that, hey, that's no fair, a one and a half million dollar estate and, and the state is paying for the care. You know what? Like a good attorney, I think if it's legal, then other people are certainly going to be doing it. And we owe it to our clients to do that if it's the last resort, if they did not buy long-term care insurance that would completely get rid of all this. Now, recapture. Recapture, by the way. Were you guys paying attention? When is the state? Oh, oh, one more thing. Uh, does this show when she was eligible? So this was approved on 824. You, you guys probably like the, the actual document here, right? You guys probably like, look, I figured you guys would like looking at this because this, I mean, this is a real deal here. And it says, so yeah, so all of this, all this rearranging, you see June and July down there. What is that? 
all of this, and somewhere in here it will say, oh yeah, where the arrow is, the top arrow is, you're effective as of June 1st. He paid a couple months of nursing home out of his pocket. Um, what's the attorney say? The attorney says, well, it's retroactive once you're approved. So you're going to get a check back. If they approve it, which by the way, practice management, I had them sign all kinds of stuff. Hey, we're going to move this into the annuity. We're going to do this, but I do not I will not claim that you absolutely will be approved by Medicaid. That's the attorney there. So there's a lot of cover your butt stuff that I would do because it's complicated stuff here. So anyway, he gets approved 824 for June, July, and of course, off into perpetuity, right? Not he, but she, but he's kind of the, you know, he's power of attorney and all that. Um, so isn't that interesting, right? 6-1, I remember him coming here to Des Moines, which is a couple hour drive. It was like March or May 28th or May 27th or something like that. Why? Because our snapshot, which is the, the snapshot of their financial situation, here are all the assets. They're at 117,000, not 139,000. Everything needed to be signed so that that snapshot took place. So it is effective ultimately, retroactively, June 1st. And we did it. We did exactly that. So he's coming out to my office. We're signing everything like on May 27th, whatever it was, drove two hours to do that because we needed to get stuff in place. The annuity, the Medicaid compliant annuity, it took him like a day to issue that. Um, what was most important was when it was actually funded, when the check was sent and everything. But you know, so that's kind of the process there. So he's going to be getting a check back. I don't think he has, at least as of last week, gotten that check back for June and July in which he paid. Now the recapture. So the farmland, are they going to come back after the farmland? Folks, when are they going to come after the farmland? Uh, when are they going to come after that recapture? Were you paying attention earlier? And then we're done here in three minutes. When are they going to come after the farmland? And what happens to avoid them coming after the farmland? Because upon recapture, the farmland is not a non-countable asset. That farmland is a part of the estate. That is subject to recapture. Well, crap, Charlie, why, why did we even do all this? Well, how do we avoid all that? When is the state going to call up? Yes, when he dies, that's absolutely correct. So after the second spouse dies, the state is going to come back and they're going to say, you guys owe us hun possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars. What are we working on now? An irrevocable trust, an irrevocable trust to put the farmland in, other things in that is completely separate from anything that he owns. Now. There's five-year look back type stuff, but um, the irrevocable trust will help with that. But even if he doesn't want to pay eight grand or whatever for the irrevocable trust, um, how much is going to be recaptured back from the estate? A lot less than if he otherwise paid out of his pocket. Folks, did I mention AIG? Uh, call me regarding AIG annuities. Fill out the evaluation here. This is kind of a different presentation I've done here. Fill out the evaluation that's going to pop up in like 45 seconds. Tell me how you like this. If you want more of this, if you want product carriers to do these, uh, get appointed with CG Financial Group. I think you'll find that a lot of this stuff is a little unique relative to what um, maybe some of our competitors are doing. But I greatly appreciate your time and please fill out the evaluation. Tell me what you think of seminars like this or webinars like this. Talk to you later. Bye.